Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Online Learning Channel. My name is Brad, and today I'm going to be assisting you with English, specifically focusing on the Grade 12 curriculum. So with regards to the curriculum, today we're going to fo be focusing on the aspect of English that refers to reading and viewing. So I have a PowerPoint uh, slide presentation that I'd like to share with you guys today that just uh, essentially guides us through the process of what it is that we can expect when it comes to um, tackling that aspect of English that refers to reading and viewing. Specifically, for today's purposes, we're going to be focusing on the aspect of poetry and literature. So without further ado, let us begin. Okay, so when it comes to this particular aspect of reading and viewing, uh, you can essentially come across three different types of poetry-like questions, if not, of course, literature-like questions. So as indicated in the slide, this is a presentation that will be focusing on literature, specifically the likes of poetry, looking at a couple of novels, for instance, and the idea of just uh, analyzing a drama piece or two. So now, of course, with regards to, you know, schooling itself, uh, many schools will, of course, um, highlight specific pieces of poetry that you may have covered in class that could of course uh, present themselves in the paper but then of course with regards to the actual novels you know all schools will have a, a specific piece that they will now be attending to so um, i trust that the the examples that we do go through in the, today's presentation will apply to you but if they don't uh, just take away the the general concepts and the general say approach that one can take in tackling whatever uh, piece of poetry, uh, whatever novel or whatever, say, item of drama that you may be covering in the English syllabus. So when it comes to this idea of literature, uh, typically you would come across this form of assessment in your English home paper two. So now this is referring to the mid-year exams. And when it comes to the actual paper itself, what we've done here is we've uh, structured it in a way that just gives you a sense as, as to what you can expect in the exam. So in section A, you would typically come across the poetry section. Section B would now refer to your literature novel. And then with regards to section C, this will refer to the drama piece, whatever that may be. So all in all, you need to answer five questions. So essentially you need to answer three in section A, one in section B and one in section C. So now when it comes to section A and poetry in particular, you have what's called prescribed poetry. So when it comes to prescribed poetry, this is essentially poetry that you may have come across in your preparations, whether it be in class, whether it be consulting with your, say, English tutors, um, you know, via extra lessons, or of course, your, your actual teachers themselves. So essentially, there are two questions. One is an unseen poem and the other is a compulsory poem. The good news is that you will have quite a, a variety of choice to choose from when it comes to not only the compulsory question, but of course the unseen poem as well. So section B, the novel or literature piece, you need to answer one question. Again, you will be given a, 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 some uh, choice and some variety when making that particular decision. And then section C, the drama piece, you would also only have to answer one question based on the variety of choices you may have. So what I've done here is I've just broken it down for you just for ease of reference. So your choice of answers for section B, the novel section, and section C, the drama section, only answer questions on the novel and drama that you have studied in particular. So again, your teacher would typically give you some guidance as to how exactly you can prepare for this particular paper. And if you feel more comfortable with covering a particular novel or particular drama piece versus another, then I would strongly suggest that you do in fact stick to what you are most comfortable with. You need to answer one essay question and one contextual question. So you'll have what's known as an essay question and a contextual question. The thing is though, if you do answer the essay question in section B, you would then have to do the, the opposite in section C. So you would then have to answer the contextual question in section, section C and vice versa. If you answer the contextual question in source in, in section C rather, then you would need to answer the essay question in uh, section, section C. 
All right, so the length of your answers in uh, section B. So the essay question on poetry should be answered in about 250 to 300 words. This is a guideline that uh, you guys can make use of. Essay questions on novel and drama sections should be a little bit more, say, uh, detailed in the sense that you would bump it up to 400 to 450 words. And the length of answers to the contextual questions should be determined by the mark allocation. Always a good indicator as to how much detail you need to provide in answering your questions. You should aim for conscientious and uh, you, you should be conscientious in, in how it is that you answer your questions, but you should also be concise and you should also offer relevant information in answering those questions. So just a, a time management breakdown for, for you as a student. So essentially when it comes to answering section A, B and C, what I've done is I've recommended that section A is or, uh, 40 minutes is dedicated to answering questions in section A, 55 minutes uh, is dedicated to answering questions in section B, and then 55 minutes dedicated to answering questions in section C. So when I spoke of uh, variety earlier and variety of choice, this is a table that uh, breaks it down quite nicely for us just to give us a sense as to what we could come across in our actual paper. So as we can see, section A is now referring to poetry, this is a prescribed po a poetry section. What you need to do is then answer any two questions from the list that you now see. So as you can see, there are no less than nine pieces that have been identified here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go through the first three examples, just to give you a sense as to how it is that you would answer these particular questions that follow the actual poetry pieces themselves. Then section B, the novel section, again, you only need to answer one question from this particular, say, choice or this particular variety of choice. As you can see, there's a, a fairly lengthy list here in the sense that uh, novels such as Animal Farm, Pride and Prejudice, The Great Gatsby, together with the picture of, jo of Dorian Gray, as well as The Life of Pi are covered in this particular piece. Once again, we will be going through a couple of examples in the next presentation that just address section B in particular. For, but for today's purposes, we'll just be focusing on section A. And then section C, the drama section, again, you only need to answer one question. Uh, particular pieces of drama or items that have now been identified in this paper, the likes of Hamlet, the likes of Othello, and the likes of The Crucible, all of course uh, famous as a result of um, none other than William Shakespeare being the, the kind of creator and founder of these particular items. So again, just a note worth mentioning, in sections B and section C, you need to answer one essay and one contextual question. You may not answer two essay questions and two contextual questions. Okay, so what we're gonna do for today's purpose, we are going to look at an ex a past exam paper, and we are going to look at the aspects of poetry as well as literature that are evident in this particular paper. So section A, without further ado, the poetry section, prescribed poetry, let us get straight into it. So question one is a poem that is now on the prescribed list. This is a poem entitled Futility that is written by Wilfred Owen. Okay, so what I have here for you is a slide that just indicates the actual poem itself. You'll notice that with poems, it is uh, structured in a way that would suggest that each line is indicated by an actual numeral or a number so as to allow you to make reference to any particular line or any particular say section of the poetry uh, of the poetry piece that may be necessary in response to an actual question or may be necessary in terms of you doing your research and locating the relevant section in order to answer the questions Okay, so Futility by Wilfred Owen. Move, in, move him into the sun. Gently, it touch, its touch awoke him once. At home, whispering of fields unsown. Always it woke him, even in France, until this morning and the snow. If anything might rouse him now, the kind old sun will know. Think how it wakes the seeds. Woke once the clays of a cold star. Our limbs, so dear achieved, our sides, full nerved, still warm, too hard to stir. Was it for this the clay grew tall? 
Oh, what made fortuitous sunbeams toil to break Earth's sleep at all? So now when it comes to poetry, it of course has a particular, say, register or a particular style that typically uh, you know, defines the poem at the end of the day. So in this particular case, it's not necessarily language that we would come across on a daily basis in terms of just normal conversation. It is structured in a way that would almost suggest that it's quite dated and it doesn't necessarily make grammatical sense at first glance, but it's, it's more, it's, there's, there's more to poetry than just, um, you know, analyzing it on a, on a surface uh, level. So what we need to do is we just need to almost um, take the poem at uh, face value to begin with. Then what we need to do is we need to try and understand the poem for ourselves in terms of what our own interpretation of this poem may be. And then of course, we need to go into the, the actual say structured details, maybe looking at the, the various sections of the poem, um, you know, in a kind of, you know, step-by-step -step, uh, manner that just allows us to break it down piece by piece so as to understand the, the broader picture that's been of course, um, brought across for us as the viewers or the readers. So now in this particular case, the poem Futility itself focuses on the tragedy of war. So now war is of course, never an ideal um, you know, scenario that one would like to find themselves in. It's a, it's a scenario or a series of scenarios where obviously you know, death is, is quite a central theme and destruction and general say suffering. So at this, in this particular case, the poem is now referring to the tragedy of war, the fact that it's, it's, a, it's a shame that war would have to take place in the first place. So by close reference to the diction, together with the imagery, as well as the tone of the poem, what we need to do in this particular question is critically discuss the validity of the statement. Okay, so your response in this particular case would uh, take the form of a well-constructed essay of 250 to 300 words, about a page in length. So think about it in the sense that this would um, now require you to write a, a full page in response to the question, critically discuss the validity of the statement. And ideally one would um, you know, look at the various themes, the various uh, aspects of the poem that just reinforce the fact that war is at the end of the day, a tragedy and ideally should not take place if one can avoid it. So you'll notice that this is worth 10 marks. So you need to elaborate enough um, to be awarded uh, 10 marks, but at the same time, you don't want to find yourself, um, you know, getting carried away and just rambling on and on and on without any kind of purpose or without any kind of um, cohesion that will allow you to achieve those marks at the end of the day. You need to be relevant when it comes to offering an answer. So now when it comes to the actual say answer itself, this is something that um, I, I would like to offer you as a potential say answer. This is um, effectively a memorandum, if you will, for this particular question. And as we read through this particular piece, you'll notice how it is that this particular, these series of statements will critically analyze the validity of that statement made in the previous slide. So the tragic and pointless loss of the soldier's life is the focus of the poem. This view is introduced by the title, Futility, and developed throughout the poem. So now when it comes to futility, um, you know, obviously you need to understand the meaning behind that particular term or that particular, say, um, title. So in, in, in this particular case, it's, it's referring to the idea that despite all efforts to now secure some kind of victory in defeating your, your so-called enemy, it is futile at the end of the day because essentially it doesn't really achieve much other than the fact that people lose their lives, which is not something that is worth pursuing. So the, the soldier's death is unrelated to the battle itself, but rather uh, a consequence of the har harsh weather conditions or the snow that's evident in this particular case, under which he was forced to live in the actual trenches of this particular conflict. The fact that his death is not a result of his defense of his country emphasizes the pointlessness of his death. So in this particular case, the soldier didn't necessarily succumb to any kind of wounds or any kind of, say, injuries that would be typical of a soldier that's been, say, fired upon in a particular battle. In this case, he succumbed to the elements and unfortunately has now uh, passed away as a result of the, the drop in temperature 
or the, the freezing like uh, conditions or the weather that is now presenting itself. So the soldier's potential to contribute positively to his community as a farmer is unrealized and untapped. The phrase fields unsown in this particular case suggests the unfulfilled potential that is lost unnecessarily in war. So it seems that he is a farmer by trade and ultimately he could be contributing more productively on his particular farm as opposed to on the battlefield or in the trenches in this particular case. So the contrast between the life-giving force of benevolence or kind sun and the ineffectiveness of the fortuitous sun emphasizes the violence and the foolishness of war that ultimately many of the soldiers would have to em embrace and have to endure. So the speaker's dis uh, desperation in trying to revive the soldier is poignant. The fragility of life is implied by the speaker in the phrase still warm. So it's offering some sense of hope. Thus the tragedy of war is heightened. So even though there is a sense of hope, it is very, very minimal. And ultimately the conditions would uh, consume in this particular case, the soldier eventually. So the use of rhetorical questions in stanza number two reinforces the speaker's bitter or cynical or frustrated, frustrated and angry tone. The speaker's tone might be of despair and hopelessness at the senseless destruction of a young life. So again, many of the soldiers would have been young men uh, with um, you know, many years to live if they weren't necessarily in a kind of war-torn say scenario, but unfortunately due to the nature of this conflict, their lives may be cut short quite significantly. Okay, so with regards to section A, we're gonna move on to the next question. So this is a contextual poem. So not so much an essay this time, just referring to the context of this particular poem. It's uh, a poem entitled an, an, an Abandoned Bundle, excuse me, An Abandoned Bundle by Mbuyesi Mbuyesini Oswald Mchali. Okay, so as we can see, the poem is structured into various lines indicated by the numbers. And let us get straight into it then. So the morning mist and chimney smoke of White City Jabawu flowed thick yellow as pus oozing from a gigantic saw. It smothered our little houses like fish caught in a net. Scavenging dogs draped in red bandanas of blood fought fiercely for a squirming bundle. I threw a brick, they bared fangs, flicked velvet tongues of scarlet and scurried away, leaving a, multi a mutilated corpse, an infant dumped on a rubbish heap. Oh, baby in the manger, sleep well on human dung. Its mother had melted into the rays of the rising sun, her face glittering with innocence, her heart as pure as untrampled dew. Okay, so with regards to this particular piece, the, the questions are now asking us to refer to specific lines in, the, in this particular poem. So this would typically be quite different to the, the poetry essay in the previous question. This is more so contextual in its nature and uh, looking to examine the, the reader's ability to now focus in on a particular point or a particular line being mentioned in the poem and elaborate thereafter by answering questions. So as we can see, the first question is asking us to refer to line seven to eight. It's smothered out in a, uh, in a net. Okay, so explain what the word court conveys about life in White City, Jabawu. Okay, so in this particular case, it court suggests that the people are unable to escape the hardship of life in this particular township. Just as they are surrounded by the smog, they are entrapped by their circumstances. So two marks would be awarded for any idea that's well discussed or any two relevant points or distinct points that are made by the actual writer. Okay, question number two. What is the effect of using its line 22 in reference to the infant. Okay, so we'd have to go back to line 22 and we'd have, we'd see that its mother is now being mentioned in line 22. So its is impersonal and usually used when referring to non-human things. So the infant is dehumanized. He or she is not given a name or gender or any form of identity. This reinforces the idea of there being no value attached to, to this particular infant's life. Okay, so as indicated in the poem. Question 2.3, refer to the line 
to refer to line 19, baby in the manger, discuss the significance of the comparison between the infant and the baby in the manger. This is worth three marks. It's going to ask, ask of you a little bit more detail than previously mentioned in the, in the questions prior to 2.3. So both were born in humble circumstances, but uh, while Jesus, as uh, many would regard as the baby in the manger, or perhaps the most say famous story of a being of a baby born in a manger was valued and revered this infant is not so the infant has died as an innocent paying for the sins of its parents just as D jesus died for the sins of mankind however this infant's potential to influence the world will never be realized due to the harsh circumstances that uh, present themselves so three marks would be awarded for any two ideas that are well discussed or any three ideas that are elaborated on. So to question 2.4, refer to lines 22 to 25. Its mother has trampled as untrampled dew. So the question is asking us to critically discuss how these lines contribute to the central idea of the poem. So now the poem is about the dehumanizing effects that apartheid and poverty have on the behavior of people. By describing the mother as innocent, the speaker shows sympathy and absolves the mother of responsibility, instead suggesting that the blame lies elsewhere. These circumstances are not due to her own decisions and her own say doing. It's uh, a consequence of the socio-economic say environment in which this particular family resides. So he believes that her circumstances prevent her from behaving in a maternal manner, as of course any mother would want. Okay, so what does it mean to answer contextual questions versus essay type questions? Well, it all essentially boils down to the type of answers that you produce. So now when it comes to the essay question, as we saw previously, one would have to elaborate quite extensively on critically discussing a particular point being made, as was of course indicated in the question. But when it comes to contextual questions, this is often the case where you would receive you know, up to four or five questions per poem that ultimately will ask you to deconstruct, if you will, specific aspects of the poem or particular sections of the poem that would then, of course, reinforce the broader understanding or the broader meaning behind the poem. And it's a, it's a, a way of trying to get into the head of the actual poet themselves and, and try and understand from what perspective they are coming from. Okay, so moving on then to, again, Focusing on section A and the prescribed poem, we're going to now be looking at question number three. All right, so question number three is referring to a poem that is entitled Lake Morning in Autumn, and this is by the, uh, a poet by the name of Douglas Livingston. Okay, so as we can see here, we have 21 lines of, of poetry that's now being offered to us, and let us, um, let us then read through this poem and, and understand it for ourselves. So before sunrise, the stork was there, resting the pillar of his body on stick legs growing from the water. A flickering gust of pencil slanted rain swept over the chill autumn morning, and he too tired to arrange. His wind buffeted plumage perched swaying a little neck flattened, ruminative, beak on chest, contemplative eye. Fill me with star vistas and hollow, black migratory leagues. Strangely, ponderously alone, and some weeks early, the dawn struck, and everything sky, water, bird, reeds, was blood and gold. He sighed, stretching his wings, he clubbed the air, slowly, regally, so very tired. Aiming his beak, he carefully climbed, inclining to his invisible tunnel of sky his feet trailing a long, long time. Okay, so let us look into the details that surround this particular poem by answering a series of questions. So the first question is asking us, how do the words before sunrise in the very first line influence the reader's feelings towards the stork? So clearly this is a poem about a stork and a poem that's now looking to elaborate on the livelihood of this particular stork and the encounters that the stalk is having with its environment. So before sunrise, how does this influence the reader's feeling towards the, the actual stalk? Well, the reader, the reader could feel sympathy for the stalk because it's dark and it's a cold autumn morning. The stalk has possibly been waiting at the lake for a long, long time. 
So never ideal, of course, to be waking up at, uh, you know, in the early hours of a cold and chilly and frosty uh, autumn morning. But in this particular case, one would typically feel a, a sense of sympathy if that was to be the case, even for a stalk. So what impression of the stalk is created by the use of the word regally? Okay, this is line 18. So regally suggests that the stalk is majestic and stately in its movements. It is elegant, it's dignified, and it's graceful. It's a creature that is to be admired. So two marks uh, in both cases for any relevant or distinct points that are being made in response to these questions. Question um, 3.3, I believe, yes. Question 3.3, so it's asking us to refer to lines 11 and 12. Okay, so lines 11 and 12, as we can see there, bottom left-hand corner of this particular slide. Uh, hollow black migratory leagues discuss the appropriateness of this image in the context of the Pope. Okay, so the journey ahead is compared to an empty darkness. The image is appropriate because it emphasizes the loneliness of the stalk and the long journey that awaits him. The word black implies danger and death in this particular context. The image conveys the suffering and hardship which the stalk will have to endure as a result of its migratory patterns. So in this particular case, three marks are awarded for any two ideas that are well discussed or any three points that are elaborated on uh, in, a, in a concise and a, and a kind of uh, comprehensive like manner. Okay, moving on to question 3.4, refer to lines 16 to 20, he sighed, stretching, tunnel of sky. So often is the case in these questions when it uh, makes mention of the fact that you need to refer to lines say one or 18 or in this particular case 16 to 20 it will often then quote the actual piece that um, is being made, made mention of so that, that allows you to again just cross reference quite easily so these lines depict a strong creature that accepts its fate do you agree with the statement and justify your response so it's asking um, you to respond uh, in, a, in a kind of two-part manner. So essentially the first part is asking you whether you agree with the statement. These lines depict a strong creature that accepts its fate. And ultimately, you need to justify your response by offering any kind of evidence that you may have come across in the poem. So in this particular case, I have agreed that the stalk sighed, which reveals its resignation. So often when one sighs, it's indicating that you haven't, much, you haven't got much to give. It then points its beak in the direction of flight and slowly and deliberately takes off in spite of the adversity awaiting it. So even though there's quite a, a heaviness that could be awaiting the stalk, it still embarks on its journey. The heaviness of the word clubbed conveys the enormous effort required to fly. It follows its, inst its instinct despite being alone. The tunnel of sky conveys the distance it has to cover and how focused it is on reaching the end. This is a stalk that's clearly uh, looking to uh, you know, achieve its objective, whatever that may be. The tunnel suggests a narrow flight pattern, which the stalk will instinctively follow. So not taking any chances, relying on instinct, relying on experience, and ultimately trusting the process. So three marks for any two ideas that are well discussed in reference to this particular point. Okay, so when it comes to poetry and when it comes to literature, it may not necessarily be um, clear and straightforward to begin with at first glance when reading through the poem, but obviously with uh, some guidance courtesy of the questions and just uh, utilizing a couple of techniques that ultimately you know, refer to mark allocation and just elaborating on points in a way that allows you just to you know, reinforce your answers these can easily uh, allow you to you know, gain as many marks as possible and ultimately come up with a, a sound conclusion as to how it is that you interpret your poems and your pieces of literature at the end of the day, because that's the beauty of um, this aspect of English, reading and viewing. It allows you to interpret these pieces in your own particular manner, as opposed to sticking to a pre-defined uh, um, you know, way of thinking and, and way of thought. So I hope that you enjoyed today's presentation focusing on section A of this particular exam paper. Don't forget that in our next presentation, we'll be focusing on section B, uh, looking at the novel aspect of this particular English home paper too. 
thank you for tuning in to the online learning channel. My name is Brad once again, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Goodbye.